Nehekara is the graveyard of entire armies. Uncountable bodies, weapons, and war machines lay buried under the hot sands of the lands that hosted the most powerful human civilization the world has ever known. Mankind was united under the rule of a single powerful man until tragedy struck. Of the many rulers who desired utmost power in a world full of temptations and riches, Setra was amongst the few who had both the ambition and the competency to claim it all. His obsessed campaign for domination through his peculiarly long reign truly changed the course of history. Having forged and united the first and perhaps greatest human kingdom in the history of the world, the majesty, power and size of Nehekara once stood as the proud and shining beacon of all mankind. In this lore overview episode, we will explore one of the greatest characters in all of Warhammer Fantasy. Known by many godly titles, such as Setra the Imperishable, High King of Nehekara, Ruler of the Four Horizons, Lord of the Earth, the King of Kings, Monarch of the Sky, and many more. Setra truly shines as one of the greatest rulers the world has ever known, and instead of living beings, he marches to war with vast hosts of uncountable skeletons armed with deadly weapons, mighty chariots, and constructs of legendary proportions. How this came to be is the story we will explore today. Long ago, long before the race of man came into being, the gods of the desert walked the ancient lands that later would be known as Nehekara. Through ancient drawings and glyphs that have been discovered in the ruined buildings of once majestic cities, it is believed the gods waged war with the ancient evil spirits that lurked in the hot desert during those legendary times. Battles of gigantic proportions lasted for centuries until Pitra, the sun god and king of the Pantheon, drove back the darkness in a final gigantic clash, riding atop a mighty golden chariot and driving back even the most powerful of demons. The evil spirits were left with only one option, to retreat far north to avoid total annihilation. In the wake of their victory, the desert gods transformed the lands into a prosperous and abundant place, full of resources and water. There they ruled unchallenged for thousands of years until the race of man finally came into being. When that happened, the gods favored them in exchange for their worship. The Pantheon gifted mankind the fertile lands and taught them how to see, how to write and read, how to communicate with each other and build great cities. The Nehekaran civilization was born and its people prospered in the great land. With the passing of time, the cities and the lands favored by the gods flourished exponentially. The kingdom of Nehekara stood as the crown of human civilization. It entered a golden age when its cities shone with majestic splendor, its armies conquered entire nations, and its kings ruled as living gods amongst men. The greatest of cities in Nehekara was Khemri, the city of kings. All monarchs by tradition would bow to the king of Khemri, who was considered to be the first amongst equals. When Setra was the throne prince of Khemri, he fought beside his powerful father and led their legions battle after battle. 
They fought rebellions, foreign invaders, green-skinned tribes, barbarians, and even other kingdoms. Cetra's military skills quickly rose above those of the most famed war champions of their age. Even at that ancient time, Cetra was already consumed with the desire for more power, and had visions of being the ruler of an empire that would outgrow all others that had existed before him. Although his strategical and martial skills were extraordinary, he soon comprehended that the path to his ultimate desire would not be straightforward. Cetra carefully listened to the priests and took their advice by heart. The one who desired to dominate the world had to win the favor of the gods. There was no other way around it. Back then, Nehekara had many kings, and they disputed lands amongst themselves and went to war for the pettiest of things. Unresolved protests, claims of ownership of some land, revenge, treachery. In the eyes of Cetra, these were all unworthy rulers. They were all inferior to his might and potential. Cetra's vision was much more than that. He wanted to create a pinnacle of civilization, expanding his rule further than what the eye could see. As the kings battled each other, the greenskin hordes and barbarian tribes that were constantly kept at bay began to push into Nehekara as the defense lines thinned. The ongoing conflict led to the kings and their armies wearing each other down in constant combat, making it impossible to maintain the gains made in their conquest. Famine and plague began to creep into Nehekara, and the constant invasions were pushing ever deeper into the great land. Cetra was determined to put an end to these petty wars between the so-called kings. He understood that to gain the loyalty of the common people and to wield the strength of the gods, he figured a proper king had to honor the ancient deities and restore the faith of all. Accordingly, when his father passed away and Cetra was crowned, his first deeds as the new king of Khemri revolved around restoring the ruined temples and building astonishing statues for the gods. On the anniversary of his coronation, Cetra called out to the divine gods to restore Khemri's glory and give him power to defeat the ones who defied him. Cetra was not a mere humble believer and a follower, but as with all of his traits, his devotion easily stepped over to the extreme. To prove his dedication, the king murdered his own offspring as an offering in a grand ritual without hesitation. As if to justify Cetra's terrible deed or to bring well-deserved prize, fresh waters returned to the dried-out Great Vitae River the next day, clearing out disease from Khemri and bringing vitality to the farmlands, thus reinvigorating the lands. This divine revelation in the city was seen as the living proof that Cetra was indeed the true chosen of the gods. So it was that Cetra became the first priest king. Soon the reputation of the first priest king of Khemri was spread all across Nehekara and sowed worry in the rival cities. The concern of the Nehekaran rulers proved to be well founded for their cities were conquered, one after the other, by the enormous battle-hardened army of Khemri. With each of the Nehekaran cities invaded, Cetra's army grew only but larger, and his challengers fewer. In time, with the last of the cities subdued and added to Cetra's growing empire, Nehekara was united under one banner for the first time in centuries. The High King of Nehekara was a tyrannical ruler who not only expected utter loyalty, but also demanded reverence and even awe from his subjects. 
The devotion of the Nehekarins for their king derived both from the belief that the unique and unprecedented power Setra possessed could solely be given by the gods themselves, and from the crippling fear of his wrath. Indeed, anyone who questioned the king's decisions or dared to think of a rebellion was crushed at once by Setra's soldiers. Once the street patrols of the king violently silenced even the faintest hints of opposition, Setra set upon a mission to rebuild and restore the cities of his ancestors to even greater glories than before. The Great Land was united under one powerful king, ruling from the sprawling city of Khemri over armies counting the hundreds of thousands, fleets of majestic ships that dominated the seas, and men living over a prosperous land. The food was always plentiful, the riches abundant, and Nehekara expanded to be greater than ever stretching from Araby through Tilia to the Sea of Dread. As Setra had promised, Khemri and all of Nehekara entered a golden age of riches and prosperity, never seen in a human civilization to that date. Even after the conquest of the neighboring lands and the enslavement of their people, the war lust of the king could not be sated. Eagerly for expansion like never before, King Setra pushed his legions into the lands beyond the horizon to conquer cities his forefathers had never set foot in. His fleet sailed across the seas to pillage the riches of unknown territories and brought back vast treasures and riches to Nehekara. At last, the name of the ruthless High King of Nehekara was feared across the mountains and beyond the vast seas. Yet Setra was restless, for his mortal body was slowly withering with the passing years. He had conquered further than the eye could see, brought down powerful kings and mighty armies, yet he was helpless in a futile war against the effects of aging. It was time that devoured his mind and turned his bones brittle, a fate predestined, the curse of the living. The most powerful of kings came to the conclusion that despite all his power and might, something as mere as death would rob him of his lands, his people, his power, and his accomplishments. Setra's visions of being the ultimate ruler of an empire that stretched across the whole world was not to be realized in one lifetime, perhaps not even in a hundred. He needed more time. In all his bitterness and arrogance, Setra began the most formidable quest of his life, which was to defeat mortality itself. In an attempt to overcome death, Setra would set in motion events that would forever scar Nehekara. He founded the Mortuary Cult and tasked his most brilliant priests with finding the key to an eternal life. The members of the newly founded Mortuary Cult spread far and wide all over the world in their quest for finding the answer to immortality. Although the immense effort of the priests provided Setra with an unnaturally extended life, the secret to immortality was not theirs to find yet. Certainly the whole reason that spread the priests from the calamity that was Setra's wrath was the discovery of something else. The wisest of them believed there was a way to build a bridge between the mortal plane and the spirit world. A grand ritual that could call Setra back from the dead and give him life in an imperishable physical body. However, the preparations of such a ceremony and perfecting the enchantments would take centuries to achieve. Left without an option, the desperate king ordered a giant pyramid to be built where his body could lay preserved until the mortuary cult prepared his resurrection in the Day of Awakening. When his time of death came, the resentful and spiteful king passed away with the burden of his defeat ever weighing on his shoulders. 
but with the hope of being resurrected one day in a paradise to rule once again. The priests prepared his body and buried him in the enormous lavish tomb filled with treasures within the massive pyramid. Not only his riches were there, but also his loyal servants and the entirety of his legions that followed him into the monument to be buried alive and wait for the promised and much anticipated day of awakening. Thousands upon thousands of loyal soldiers were buried with Setra to wait to be called once again to serve under his command. After the death of Setra, many kings sought to rise in power once again, and although Nehekara did not revert into civil war, the Golden Age was over. As time passed, each new king also demanded to be buried in a tomb like that of Setra, and the mortuary cult grew more and more powerful. The kings and nobility of Nehekara constructed their own pyramids and made rites of incantation and preservation so that they too could return from the dead and rule over a golden paradise. With centuries, Nehekara became a society obsessed with death and immortality. Skulls and skeletons became common symbols of everlasting life and they were carved on the shields, banners and chariots of the priest king's armies. As the Nehekaran's obsession with death flourished, the architecture and landscape of the great land irrevocably changed as well. No expense was spared in paving the path for immortality, and the splendor, wealth and power of Nehekara was breathtaking to behold. Their necropolises became bigger and shadowed over the towns of the living. The use of symbols of death was common in the architecture of the giant tombs, with each king demanding his pyramid to outdo his predecessors. Necropolises became common across Nehekara, and in some cases they seemed to nearby replace entire cities the works of the necrotects becoming more elaborate in their designs as time passed. In the centuries after Setra's passing, Nehekara changed with the coming of numerous diseases, war and the rule of incompetent leaders. Yet the greatest shift came to pass with the arrival of Nagash a treacherous necromancer that rose from within the ranks of the mortuary cult. Like past kings who ruled Nehekara, Nagash was consumed by greed for power and the lust for total domination. The increasingly powerful priest mixed necromancy learned from the Dark Elves and other influences. With his own vast knowledge of death from the mortuary cult, he performed profane experiments and eventually managed to create the elixir of life, finally making himself immortal. Nagash committed his learning to the Nine Books of Nagash, the most powerful source of necromantic magic in the world, but the worst was yet to come. Through evil sorcery and out of bitterness against the rulers of Nehekara, the powerful necromancer eventually accumulated so much power that he planned to steal all the living force from the world in a dark ritual without precedence. In the massive black pyramid of Nagash, all the magic power was being concentrated. Although eventually King Alcazar, the conqueror, managed to kill Nagash amidst the great ritual with a blade made of warp stone. This action caused all the magic Nagash had been wielding to spiral out of control at the moment of his death, spreading all across the once verdant lands of Nehekara. The powerful and tainted magic spread without control, crossing vast lands and going through cities, temples, rivers, mountains and killing every living thing it touched, including humans, animals and plants. The unleashed wave of necromantic magic turned the vast and marvellous cities into little more than ruins buried under mountains of sand. All was devoid of life in what seemed to be an instant that would forever change Nehekara and the future of its civilization.
The amount of power unleashed was so much that besides killing all living things, it caused some unexpected consequences as well. All across the lands, the long buried bodies of past kings and their servants began to come to life once again, along with the millions of corpses who rose up from the grave. There were also the past kings of Nehekara, the entire ancestral line of the prideful kings, fathers and sons, awoke in an unrecognizable land, which was certainly not the blissful heaven they were promised in the afterlife. The memories of their mortal lives, along with their unwillingness to yield, were preserved by the enchantment set upon their mummified bodies. The mighty kings of old now stood at the head of their enormous legions that were also brought back to life, but instead of feeling any kind of relief, what they saw terrified them all. They had been preserved and brought back to life to a desert of death. The once majestic cities were no more. A kingdom in ruins, a mere shadow of its former glory. Their bodies transformed and many even driven mad by the sight of their own hideous visage. They were reborn not into the golden paradise that was promised at the moment of their ceremonious deaths, but a tainted wasteland where they would have to contend with other kings. Before long, Nehekara was dragged into havoc yet again with the wars of the kings, for each of the perished monarchs of the land was convinced of his right to rule as at the same time of their respective deaths. They were the most powerful beings amongst the people of their age. All across the ruined civilization, the armies of living dead fought for control in thousands of battles, many of them lasting for entire days. Of all the bygone kings of Nehekara, there was only one who remained asleep in the absolute void of death. The tomb of Setra, sealed by sacred rituals, wards, and protected under mysterious writings of the priests, was untouched by the dark magic of Nagash. The priests of the mortuary cult were far from ready to revive Setra, yet, the wisest of them feared Nehekara would be torn apart for good with the already devastating wars of the Tomb Kings. If there was one king who would bring the rest to heal and unite them under one banner, that would certainly be the most superior of them all. Setra, the High King of Nehekara, King of Kings. At last, the head priest decided to break the powerful seals of the pyramid and call Setra back to life sooner than anticipated. Before his death, the priests of the mortuary cult had promised Setra that he would awake in a golden paradise where he would rule for a million years. Completely immersed with this idea of paradise, Setra had turned oblivious to the winds of change and assumed his lands would remain the same in the ages he lay dead. In the wake of his resurrection, it was this arrogance that caused his utter disbelief upon seeing all his lands plundered and its civilization ruined. The treasures he had amassed over time, after many military expeditions, were all ransacked by foreign invaders. The temples and great cities were left to crumble, and the gods he had so meticulously pleased during his lifetime seemed to have abandoned his people and his lands. So great was Setra's disappointment and anger that his callers dwindled away in fear. Yet the priest's judgment in reviving Setra, given the dire situation in Nehekara, was surely appropriate. Driven by rage and resentment, Setra summoned his mighty tomb guard and led his vast legions to war against the skeleton armies of his rivals. The smartest of the kings knew to kneel before a great ruler than themselves or be crushed under his fist. 
but many more opposed Setra and the idea to be ruled by another. Cruel battles ensued after Setra's resurrection, and the lands were submerged in a tumultuous time of war, as the mummified tomb kings possessed the same thirst for conquest that drove them in life, supported by their thousands of servants fully devoted to their kings. They all fought for their right to restore their vast empires. But Setra's thirst for domination had not diminished in the years since his passing, and his might was quickly made evident on the battlefield. I am the King of Kings, the Imperishable. The legions of the Lesser Kings were eventually crushed, and their countless bones were powdered to dust. Their past glories and potential might to be buried forever under the lands that belonged to the one true king. After the immediate chaos was settled, and the vast majority of kings were now under his banner, Setra returned to his throne and questioned his priests on the events that took place in his absence. Before him, the head priest told Setra of the terrible necromancer that was Nagash, and all of his terrible deeds that had finally cursed the entire kingdom. The King of Kings listened how this powerful but twisted usurper rose to power, became the first necromancer, created the vampire race, and intended to resurrect the tomb kings to serve his own agenda. Setra was a wise enough king to understand Nagash was no mere inept rival. His potential return was not an unlikely affair, and his right hand Arkan the Black would surely carry on searching for a way to bring his master back. Setra swore never to return to his tomb again, for there was much damage to repair and dangerous enemies to crush. First, he sent the Tomb Kings back to their graves to slumber, and tasked the Lich Priests to guard the tombs until they would be needed. The passing ages had no effect on him anymore, as he had died once already, and it was now the time to get back all that was lost, and more. Mounted atop his mighty chariot, rightfully named Chariot of the Gods, Setra rides to war with all of the Tomb Kings and their legions under his command, wearing the crown of Nehekara, which is a relic of several crowns made into one. The great king of Nehekara crosses all opposition, and no one can stand before him. His weapon, the Blessed Blade of Petra, has been infused with the power of the Sun God. Just to look upon it is to present such splendor that the eyes go blind after its brightness. The hot edge of the blade carries the heat of the desert sun, and uncountable are the ones that have fallen victim to the revered weapon. And behold, the almighty God King Setra did awaken from his sleep of blessed oblivion. His legions long buried beneath the sands, did arise and stand to attention, awaiting his order. And he did say, WAR! And the world did tremble. Setra the Imperishable now fights to restore the vast lands of Nehekara to their former majesty, striking forth from the desert to reclaim the world from the living and the dead alike. Mighty constructs advance inexorably across the sands, while rank after rank of skeleton warriors advance alongside them. The warriors of Nehekara are not mindless skeletons that march and fight at the will of a single necromancer. No, they are powered by their own souls that they had with their former bodies and bonded together again by the incantation of the Lich Priests that have summoned them from the realm of souls. They remember their unwavering loyalty to their kings, and they will fight and die once again for them. The bravest and most skilled of all warriors in all of Nehekara are the Tomb Guard, as they are the King's elite guard. 
with unparalleled discipline and martial prowess, they are often found where the fight is thickest and the best of the Tomb King's fighting force are needed. They spill the blood of their enemies with implacable determination and have done so for many centuries. As the legions advance, volleys of screaming, flaming skulls hover over them. The skies are filled with the horrific screams and wailing shrieks of agony of those slaughtered in the battlefield. These flaming skulls are launched by the massive catapults of the Tomb Kings, oftentimes crewed by three skeleton warriors. They load and fire the war machines with silent efficiency. The ammunitions are cursed by the Lich Priests, so the skulls scream as they arc the sky, until they hit their target, sending fragments of splintered bone everywhere and involving those nearby in a ball of green and blue fire. Many battle-hardened warriors have gone mad just by listening to the outworldly sound of those flaming skulls. Towering above all and crushing their way through the lowly ranks of enemies, giant statues known as war sphinxes, tearing apart everything in their way, while they are themselves almost impervious to harm, thanks to their stone-hard hides. These were constructed to guard the entrances to the Tomb Kings in their sanctums, and in times of war, they are reanimated to go into battle and silence the life of any who stands in their way. The Hero Titans are gigantic animated statues that carry a staff which bears the hieroglyph of the Sun God and light the Hero Titans path as it walks the worlds that separate the living and the dead. The other hand grasps a giant pair of scales in which the souls of the kings are judged by the God of the Underworld. In the field of battle, they can unleash their light to turn enemies into flames and can even rip the foe's souls from their bodies. In the thick of the fight, Ushapti often emerge from the sands right behind their foes or in their flanks. They charge immediately and unleash total destruction upon their enemy, cutting them to pieces with every sweeping arc of their heavy blades, sending waves of broken bone and shattered steel flying in the air. Setra and the Tomb Kings are coming to reclaim their rightful dominion, and woe betides any that stands in their way. Battles in Nehekara tend to be fought along the caravan routes and in the vicinity of ancient necropolises because these attract adventurers and tomb robbers. Encounters with orcs and barbaric tribes are common and they are dealt with with the full uncontained fury of the undead host. The sacking of their treasures is an offence that can't be forgiven and the tomb kings ensure every last trinket stolen is returned to their domain and every trespasser put to the sword. Their bloodied bodies are left lifeless and unburied under the baking sun until nothing but bones remain and the sands ultimately reclaim all trace of their existence. Dark Elves expeditions have occasionally managed to advance deep into the lands of the dead. When that happens, increasingly bigger armies are raised from the infinite pool of bones that is a desert, and the intruders are dealt with swift vengeance. Nehekara has also been invaded more than once by lizardmen from the Southlands, who are constantly searching for lost plaques looted from their temple cities in the past. The records account of one time when they reached the capital, but they were finally defeated when priests focused the rays of the sun through mirrored prisms atop the city's gold-capped pyramids towards the cold-blooded beasts, burning them all to death. Today, we dispatch these faithless barbarians, these petty thieves, in tribute to Jaff, the god of war and death. He will feast as the jackal dies and grow fat on their souls. For who dares stand before Setra in defiance of his will? 
Ah, Nahakara is the land of the dead, and Setra the Imperishable is a god there. Standing ever watchful for the return of Nagash and any other invader, he has bowed to never again slumber, lest his kingdom slide into ruin. Thousands upon thousands of battles have been fought in the barren sea of sand that is Nehekara, and it shall be so until the end of times. Thank you for watching my friends, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, the main challenge for this particular episode was trying to recreate the lands of Nehekara before they truly became the land of the dead. There are very few resources like images or even in-game footage that one can use in order to recreate the most powerful civilizations of humans at that time. The game and even the lore present Nehekara in its present form, like a once vast and powerful civilization now buried under the hot desert sands. I hope you enjoyed the video regardless, my friends, and now let's talk about Setra himself. This legendary lord, despite being one of the most accomplished and powerful characters in all of the lore, is still a tyrannical and cruel king. It doesn't help that he actually demanded the adoration and worship of his servants, and don't you dare question his decisions, because you'd soon find yourself at the edge of the blade. And just before we go, I wanted to personally thank the awesome new patrons and YouTube channel members that have joined the channel in the last few days. Hampu, a raging baboon, Andrew Nguyen, Monterosa, Mark Ferry, and Aruk Espinosa. If you also want to join us over in our Discord server and help the channel grow, please consider checking out the links in the description below. Speaking of Patreon channel members and such, we recently did a poll to determine some of the future content for the channel, and let me tell you that we will be having more Lizardment content coming later this month, along with some other stuff that we have already planned. So thank you for watching up until this point my friends, and if you stick around just for a little more, be prepared to watch some of the majestic titles that Sethra has under his name. See you soon! It is important to note that Setra is also known for many titles, including Great King, the Imperishable, Kemrekara, the Great King of Nehekara, King of Kings, Opener of the Way, Wielder of the Divine Flame, Punisher of Nomads, the Great Unifier, Commander of the Golden Legion, Sacred of Appearance, Bringer of Light, Father of Hawks, Builder of Cities, Keeper of the Hours, Chosen of Petra, High Steward of the Horizon, Sailor of the Great Vitae, Sentinel of the Two Realms, The Undisputed, Begetter of the Begat, Scourge of the Faithless, Carrion Feeder, First of the Charnel Valley, Rider of the Sacred Chariot, Vanquisher of Vermin, Champion of the Death Arena, Mighty Lion of the Infinite Desert, Emperor of the Shifting Sands, He Who Holds the Scepter, Great Hawk of the Heavens, Arch Sultan of Atalan, Waker of the Aero Titan, Monarch of the Sky, Majestic Emperor of the Shifting Sands, Champion of the Desert Gods, Breaker of Ogre Clans, Builder of the Great Pyramid, Terror to the Living, Master of the Never-Ending Horizon, Master of the Necropolises, Taker of Souls, Tyrant to the Foolish, Bearer of Petra's Holy Blade, Scion of Osirian, Scion of Nehek, the Great Chaser of Nightmares, Keeper of the Royal Herat, Founder of the Mortuary Cult, Banisher of the Great Aerophant, High Lord Admiral of the Death Fleets, Guardian of the Charnel Pass, Tamer of the Lich King, Unliving Jackal Lord, Dismisser of the Warrior Queen, Charioteer of the Gods, He Who Does Not Serve, Slayer of Redditras, Scarab Purger, Favored of Usirian, 
player of the great game, liberator of life, Lord Sand, wrangler of scorpions, emperor of the dunes, eternal sovereign of Kemri's legions, seneschal of the great sandy desert, cursorer of the living, regent of the eastern mountains, warden of the eternal necropolis, herald of all heralds, caller of the bitter wind, god tamer, master of the mortis river, guardian of the dead, great keeper of the obelisks, deacon of the ash river, belated of wakers, general of the mighty flame, summoner of sandstorms, master of all necrotects, prince of dust, tyrant of Araby, purger of the greenskin breathers, killer of the false gods champion, tyrant of the gold dunes, golden bone lord, avenger of the dead, carrion master, warden of the hex lands, breaker of Jahaf's bonds, and many, many more.